This week on Dig Me Out, Tim and Jay talk with Chavez guitarist Clay Tarver. Hello and welcome to another episode of Dig Me Out. I'm your host Tim Minichi and joining me for episode 202, 202 of season 4, my co-host Mr. Jason Ziak. Jay, how are yes. you this evening? Fantastic. Excellent. We're recording on a weekday, not a weekend. It's a little bit of a change of pace this week. We did an interview last week with Bill Janovitz of Buffalo Tom. We have an interview this week. Unfortunately, you weren't able to make it. You were out spelunking, as you do so often on the weekends, mm. and um, got lost in a cave. But we <laughs> got you back out. Slag tights did not take you down. Or is it slag mites? I was going to get confused. <laughs> what anyway. is slag? Slag tight might. I don't know. There's something there. So I had to conduct this week's interview solo with uh, Clay Tarver of Chavez, the legendary New York post-punk band... They were a band, Jay, that I I remember them from their video in the 90s. It was on Beavis and Butthead. And uh, it wasn't a band that I really got into, though, until probably 10 or 15 years later where I actually got the albums and listened to them. Um, Do you have, like, a history with Chavez? Pretty similar. I I would always get them confused at the time uh, with Gomez and Yola Tango. (laughs) Naturally. (laughs) Just, uh, you know. From a band name standpoint, Mm because, you know, I'm a white kid from the Midwest. It was later that I really uh, got into Ride the Fader quite a bit. Uh, I don't know when. I was was thinking more late 90s. And it's just been one of those records since then that I find myself going back to at least every, you know, several months and rediscovering. And Mm -hmm. I don't know. it It always sounds fresh and different. Like every time I go back to it, there's new things I discover about the band. So both records uh, at this point. They had two records, Gone Glimmering came out in 1995 and Ride the Fader came out in 1996. They also put out an EP called Pentagram Ring. And then uh, there was a compilation released, Better Days Will Haunt You in 2006, which compiled uh, the albums, the EP and some singles all into one box set. I should mention that Clay played in a band before Chavez called bullet la volta and they were around for quite some time in the 80s i had a bullet la volta live cassette whoa i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure uh it was one of those bands that i would always hear about see the Mm -hmm. name everywhere the press and and stuff and always curious what they were about Um, i always thought the name was cool so i think i just bought like a you know in a cutout bin or something like uh, they had a live ep maybe um, on cassette that I picked up in the gotcha probably the early 90s. So Clay Tarver's had an interesting career. Besides being in Bolt La Volta and Chavez, he worked at MTV. He's directed videos. Um, he did the uh, the video sp- the spots with Donald Logue, who was Jimmy the Cab Driver, and Donald Logue had been the road manager for Bolt La Volta. He is a co-writer of the movie Joyride with J.J. Abrams, and he currently is the writer and producer on the HBO show Silicon Valley. Um, So, Jay, you had a chance to check out the interview that I did with him. Anything stand out from that interview that you want to let people know that's coming up? Well, first off, I was just really blown away about how generous he is (laughs) with his time and with with information and just, you know, uh, he seems, you know, genuinely interested to, you know, talk about the band and share his experience and, um, even talk about his experience as a as a writer, and you can just tell he's the kind of person that he likes. He says yes to opportunities, and I think that's mm-hmm. um, proof that you know when you do that, you end up in pretty amazing places. And he's obviously been fortunate for that to happen. Um, in terms of the story, I just I, I didn't realize. I kind of knew that they were you know they all had previous um, you know levels uh, different levels of success in previous bands. I didn't realize like how I guess connected or. I don't know, they're just such a fight they're just such a, a part of the fiber of the early 90s alternative rock uh, scene and I think this interview really brings that to life with the connections they had with Matador and Guided by Voices and Bullet of Volta you know being connected to um, New Bomb Turks and you, you talk quite a bit about 
their affinity and um, time spent in Columbus, um, which I think is, is pretty pretty interesting to hear for our fans in Columbus and for those who aren't aware of the scene. It kind of gives you a little sense of mm-hmm. what role it played in the 90s. And then I think you got into some really good stuff with uh, how they um, viewed the band, how they wrote. Um, I thought it was really interesting that they knew exactly what they were going for when they formed the band. I mean, how how often do you hear people say that? Right. You know? <laughs> and that they, they kept working and it took a while to kind of realize that, that vision, which is pretty incredible to think because, I don't know, I think you could probably relate to, and a lot of people listening probably relate to, uh, you know, when you start making music, you get excited regardless of almost what it sounds like sometimes, you know, just the right. the joy of doing it. And creating things just motivates you and, and makes you feel optimistic. And to be able to kind of object, objectively stand back and say, well, this is cool, but it's not what we we're going for. So let's just keep working. Um, it's pretty amazing. And it sounds like that's what they did. So that and, and the idea of you know, just the, the mechanics of how they wrote and what they were going for in terms of dynamics and the techniques that they implied uh, to, to create the sound they did. Um, I, f- I found all that fascinating. So it's it's chock full of a bunch of um, tidbits of '90s rock history, and also a lot of insight into what made this band so unique and so timeless. That Jay is a perfect segue for us to move into the interview with Clay Tarver of Chavez. <laughs> take it's a time out on sure. sunday evening and where are you i'm in columbus ohio nice so if you it, it, you know in the attempts by our twitter followers to get you guys to uh to come out and play uh mm-hmm. that was one of my one of my friends out here sure. who uh who suggested the columbus show and then i don't know who it was who suggested the tulsa show no i don't know i'm glad we're able to start booking your next tour because that's going to be we, a lot we, of fun we had some key early shows in columbus well, that was a hotbed in the 90s. A lot of people don't yeah. think of it, you know, in the same way they think of like Boston and Seattle and Chicago. But Columbus had a it was before I I lived here. I was in college up at Bowling Green, but um they had like bands like uh, Gaunt and Thomas Jefferson Slave Apartments and a yes. lot of interest there was connections to Guided by Voices cuz yeah. You know, the the record label was down here and stuff. So, it, it was it was a pretty cool scene that was going on here. It was oh, yeah. probably the most anti-corporate commercial scene that was possible with the bands that existed down here right but we had uh you know uh, our singer matt sweeney he uh we were old friends with the new bomb turks and so um you know matt i don't know if he gets enough credit for it this is the story i tell anyway that he he bought a guided by voices record i think it was propeller from his pot dealer (laughs) and and heard it and was the guy was he was buying pot and the guy had it playing in the background matt was like what is that he's like i don't this i just bought this record it's amazing i've never heard of them there's some from like dayton ohio or something and matt walked straight from the pot dealer to the record store to buy it listened to it once and was like what the fuck is going on and called up um matt reber from the new bomb turks and was like you're from Ohio. What the hell? What is this? And he was like, I don't know. He's some like fourth grade teacher. That's all I know. And Matt totally cold wrote a letter to Bob Pollard and said, if you ever need help setting up a show or anything. And Bob called him up immediately when he got it and was like, yeah, I'd love to. And, and Matt sort of helped set up their first show in five years that's awesome and so they actually were friends of ours and they before we even had a name and so we they were the first people ever to see us play we didn't even have our bass player at that point we just and we played for them and we had recorded and we played they heard the stuff but we played we'd recorded a single and they played um they came to our rehearsal space and they traveled pretty large with all their friends and and uh, 
you know, it was pretty awesome. It was like, you know, and they seemed so old. They were like 35, 38, <laughs> and it's all crammed around in this tiny rehearsal space watching us play with like 12 packs of beer. <laughs> and um, I remember they played their show. It was amazing. And then we all hung out and Bob, we were like, we don't have a name. And I don't know why we didn't keep it, but he wrote us, wrote up a list of names <laughs> and they were all too insane to use as band names. But the two of them I remember were Mushu Wharf <laughs> and Turquoise Hercules, which was a pretty fucking great name. But um, we ended up with Chavez and the next time we saw them, they were like, once they realized that was our or the name of our band, their face is just we're crestfallen. So and then I think we played an early show at Stashes. Mm-hmm. Maybe with GBV. Definitely we played there with GBV, but we also played with the new Bomb Turks and Blonde Redhead. And maybe twice with that same lineup. And uh mm-hmm. so we always considered all our friends drove out with us from New York to do a show at in Columbus. It was like one of our first five shows, I think. Oh, wow. So, so yeah. Is so, how Stash do you have... still there? No, Stashes is gone. Stashes, due to various issues, probably fire code violations and whatnot, um, ended up moving. The owner moved it to a new, new location and it became Little Brothers. Uh-huh. And Little Brothers was around for about 10 years. And then it got turned into a lesbian restaurant. I'm not joking. Right. And um, then it got turned into some sort of weird dance club. And unfortunately, a lot of the cool sort of smaller venues that would pack, you know, 100, 200 people have sort of gone by the wayside in Columbus. And you're kind of stuck with either like little rooms of like 50 people that are sort of DIY places or you have to play like a three or 500 person venue. And it's right difficult to pack if you're a small touring sure. band and sure it's not I, I was in a band from 99 to 2008 and we were kind of in that weird period where some of those older venues were closing down and newer ones were popping up and trying to take place but they the scene was changing and as the whole everything with music was changing you know at that point with regards to uh, the, the big Ohio State campus was really the draw for a lot of people, and Mm -hmm. they just stopped going to a lot of those small clubs. Like It seemed like all the dance clubs and stuff that popped up around campus and bars sort of took that crowd away. So you'd be fighting, you know, you'd play on a Saturday night, you'd be like, sweet, we got Saturday night at so-and-so bar, but now you're competing with Ohio State football, and uh, you know the jam band that's playing down the street doing dead covers, and you're like... This isn't the same deal it was 10 years ago. Right. So how did you end up... You mentioned that playing in Columbus was one of your first five gigs. Is that because you had played with Bolt La Volta that you like knew that there were clubs here? Or how do you end up... Because it seems like if you're from... An, if you're, I mean, You guys were from New York, so it seems like you would be playing like New Jersey or Boston or, or those yeah, sorts of played, cities first. played Boston first. Well, it was weird because we were all... We were... It's funny... La Volta was definitely, we were, uh, this is going to sound ridiculous, but in that very insular indie rock world, we actually caught a lot of shit for being a super group, which is like, <laughs> um, but basically I had been in Bullet La Volta and Sweeney was in Skunk right. and sort of already the human Facebook kind of knew everybody and James Lowe you know, who I'd heard about for years before I ever met him or saw him play was in Live Skull. And he was, you know, the legendary Asian drummer from Live Skull. And um, so once we got going, and we definitely had a plan when I moved to New York, but um, people were surprised I was playing with Sweeney because they were just like, what's that guy? What's that, you know? And of course, obviously he's turned out to be such a, a force for good in the music world, but he was sort of between opportunities, as they say. I think he was un, it was unclear whether he would play in bands again. He was really burned out, burnt, not burnt out, but burnt by mm-hmm. his experience with Skunk. 
And he was actually Bola LaVolta's roadie. And I just really loved talking with him. And we had the same sort of idea of what we wanted to do with music. And so when LaVolta split up, I moved from... And we had played Columbus a bunch of times. And we're friends a little bit with the new Bomb Turks. But when I moved to uh, New York, Matt has this whole crew of New Jersey friends. And I randomly moved into a building that was like above the, on the, I lived on the, I was moving into the fourth floor. And on the second floor was this guy, Paul Summerstein, who was like somehow just super close to the new mom Turks. And he grew up with Matt and Stephen Apicella Hitchcock, who was also, they all just loved the new bomb Turks. And whenever they would come in town, they were just best buddies with them. Paul is now sort of a big music lawyer in New York, independent guy, but like he's done really well. And uh, so anyway, they were just, I always liked Matt Reber, but they were like, every time they would come, we just became friends. And, and so I think we just wanted a gig and we actually did really well in in Columbus, like people seem to like us. And, um, and we just, I think we went on a little tour with guided by voices. We played there and then we, I think we did even a one-off where we just drove all the way out there, like two vans of us like cruised out to play with the new Palm Turks and blonde redhead who were nothing then. And we did okay. You know, people liked us, but, um, our first show was in Boston. We opened for Come, and I thought it was going to be this big homecoming, and no one gave a shit at all. <laughs> and we played it at the Middle East. In our second show, I feel like we opened for the Afghan Whigs at like the Academy or something. Okay. And uh, they were also Greg's one of my older, oldest music friends. I mean, we're still really. He lives a mile away from here and we hang out pretty much a lot you know as much as a guy with three kids and a single right. father and you played out. on the and, most recent record right yeah yeah and he played on bullet of Ulta stuff so we were we met the day of the earthquake during that world series in 89 okay and we've been friends ever since i don't know how but we have <laughs> and um, so anyway, and then we were really close friends with God of Voices, so we we just were, there was always sort of a big Ohio appreciation. I don't know. But we, I loved it. I always loved playing shows in Columbus. And I bet I played Stashes probably six times. Wow. Like yeah. If if they, I don't know if they kept any of the, uh, any of the walls in there if they everything was torn down or not but and i would I, imagine that uh quite a few uh posters and stickers were chavez ones yeah at that so we we were sort of a when i say super group it was a joke and people like i'm i'm really old friends with guys who run matador like i've known them each of them since before they started it each of the three big guys <laughs> And like one of them I went to college with and mm -hmm. Patrick Amory and he was the ran the radio station, you know, had as much to do with my musical imprint on my brain as anybody. And um but it was started by Chris Lombardi and Gerard who I'd known and and um I'm really good friends with Chris and Patrick. And uh, I mean I've known Gerard forever, but I'm much closer to those guys and um, so anyway, um, when we started, we knew I moved to New York and I knew that we, I knew we, I, what I wanted to do. And I had had sort of a shitty experience with Will of Ulta getting signed to a major label. It was one of those weird things where we played the game and did everything. And it was like, I took a lot of people's advice to, to, take the band in that direction to sign to a major label. And then once it was shitty, there was nothing anyone could do to get me out of it. So we, and, and in that year, like I worked at MTV and right stuff there. And it was funny because we, Matt and I just both sat out the whole alternative nation revolution 
I was actually a producer of Alternative Nation for quite a while, and like you know, old friends of mine would come through, and it was pretty humbling. <laughs> and I don't know what we were thinking, but we just decided, like, fuck it, we should just do good music. And we were these ultra connected guys in many ways. And I mean, without trying, maybe Matt tried, but I don't think I tried, but we were just really connected guys. And we, people were, were like, whoa, what's going on with your band? What's going And we, um, we knew creatively exactly what we wanted to do. And I think when people heard it, they were, they were slightly mortified that it was so like, like, I don't know, aggressively weird or I don't know what it was. Yeah. And people were like, we thought it was awesome. And people were just like, you know, like sort of not freaked out, but literally had no idea what to make of it. In fact, we had signed. So anyway, we, I think we literally got, but, but just because of who we are, it seemed like a good bet for people. And I think we literally got an, an offer from Electra and we just never returned the phone call. And we (laughs) fired our lawyers. And I mean, I didn't use the same lawyer that we had LaVolta had. He was a really nice guy and people wanted to manage us and we were really like, fuck it. We want to either live or die by the music, which is probably a really stupid thing to do. But, and then, you know, I remember this is a pretty amazing story. I don't even know if I've ever told anyone in, in an interview situation, this story, but like, the guys in Matador are like some of my best friends. And so it were always really weird about me starting this band. They'd be like, what's been going on? It's been a year and I haven't heard anything. What's the deal? And so when we finished, we finished a, a tape of, uh, what's our first single? Repeat the ending. And Chris Lombardi calls me up one day and he's like, I heard you. I heard you recorded and I was like, yeah. And he's like, I want to hear it. I want to hear it. I was like, oh, fuck. And so I called up Matt and I was like, you know, should we let him? And Matt was like, I guess so. I don't know. I don't know what we do. We might as well. So I, I remember standing outside of the Matador office, like just like, fuck, I don't want to play him this. He, he's going to hate it. And it's going to be a huge bummer. These are my friends who I respect. Fuck it. And I pressed and I got buzzed in and he just, tortured me and he literally was like oh so this is uh this is the super group i heard about i heard so much about (laughs) this is what yeah this is gonna be like Ooh, let me write on the here and first he's like i'm gonna put he wrote on the tape cassette tape at that time like mustique because he was like that's where you're gonna record right mustique in the caribbean you know you're gonna that's you're gonna (laughs) fancy super group here let me put and he literally put it on a pile of demos they'd been sent and you know it's like i'll get to it in a few months it was hold on let me let me let me play you something literally that day he had just gotten cut your hair by pavement (laughs) and so i had to sit there like just being tortured as he blasted it like sit for the whole three minutes and 13 seconds whatever it was and i was and then i left just like feeling like shit like oh my god and that night um, he called me up and he was like, and I was like, hello. And he was like, I think your song's amazing. I was like, don't fuck with me. He's like, no, I really think it's amazing. I was like, don't fuck with me. He was like, I really think it's amazing, Clay. I really like it. I was like, what? He's like, it's fucking great. I was like, bullshit. He was like, yep, I wouldn't believe it.
so we we they got it when we signed with them we we <laughs> been gone well out of our way to get a, a european deal with our very good friend chris christoph ellinghouse who did city slang and matador it was very important for them to get <laughs> um international territories and we said no we have to stick to our guns and be our good friend so we drew up the whole contract we did everything <laughs> and he heard the first record <laughs> and was like uh yeah i can't do this and he he was like i don't i don't like it <laughs> we were like what huh yes and so we had to go back to matador and without, we had given them the tape as well. And without asking them, and they hadn't gotten back to us. They just don't really communicate that way. But we didn't know if they hated it too. And we didn't know what to do. But we were like, uh, so anyway, we can't tell if you like the record. But if you do, you can have the European territories now. <laughs> How about we do the world? And fortunately, they really liked it. So, so Well, that was, worked out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very funny. So, you mentioned anyway. about you, you mentioned about the difference between the the sound of or you had a very specific idea of what you were looking for or mm -hmm. what you wanted to do with Chavez and that is quite a bit different than with Bullet. So, yeah. what in your I guess were, were there some bands that you discovered when you moved to New York and you were like, or was this just a preconceived idea yeah. when you were done with Bullet? You were like, I want to do something more challenging. I want to do play guitar in a different way than I've been playing yeah. it. Yeah, uh, definitely, absolutely. I mean, I think. Look, La Volta was. Um, I don't think our records. I guess the first EP and definitely the first album had moments, but we really lost our way, and it was just there were five of us in the band, and it, in, you know, I'm super collaborative guy, and I was probably the band leader, but I wasn't harsh enough about like you know this just can't be a democracy and once we sort of had a little bit of success it just the waters got muddied pretty pretty severely um but having said that like we were like just a force and we were there were times where i felt like that was the best band on the planet and it was so fun to play we were just so good live and it was just a blast and we were just this mighty machine and that was great but by the end of it i was like i was really i had very we matt and i had very very strong ideas about what kind of music we wanted to do and it was there was no meeting anyone in new york i mean i knew everyone already we felt like I, I definitely wanted to play guitar completely differently than I had, and so so much so that I started changing my tunings. So it would force me to do different ways of playing okay. and break break my habits of you know stuff. And for example, you know, and I still use this tuning all the time. I drop the low E string down to a C. Okay, and just nothing quite your hand fits differently around mm -hmm. that. I don't know why. And it just sort of forces you to do a little bit more minor chord and kind of weird, weird, uh, intervals. And, and I didn't quite know. Sometimes it's awesome because I don't know what the note is. And it forces me to listen and play by feel rather than by habit. And so, uh, that, but which record are we talking about, by the way? Is there one record, or is it just... Uh, this is sort of just an overview. Jim. Yeah. So, okay. You so, know, we just did uh, Use Your Illusion 1 and 2 for our 200th, yeah. and there are less songs in the Chavez entire catalog than just in those two records, so I felt like we could cover both albums okay. Okay. <laughs> in one episode. So, so I would say this, that the first... We knew what we wanted to do, but we didn't know how to do it. And it took forever. And what we wanted to do was was to take all of this angular music that we liked, but actually write songs to it. Like to take the Jesus Lizard, but write a song. 
mm-hmm. like an actual melody and something that was a song song. And I, I'm, I'm saying that I don't mean to say that they don't, but we, that was always like sort of our goal or to take like, come was a big influence on us in terms of the guitar interplay. There was just sort of this thing that happens with them where you can't tell which guitar is playing what. And, um, and we would really that once we sort of locked into that way of playing together, then it just was like, Oh, you know, I have no idea what Matt's doing. He has no idea what I'm doing, but it sort of sounds shimmery together. And then we were, uh, the, the big key, the first good song that we wrote was repeat the ending. And once we did that, we knew exactly. It was like, okay, this is what we do. And then, then it was like, but I mean, I think we dicked around for a year. I mean, I quit at one point because we had no progress. And But once we made that song, it was like, okay, that's what we're going to do. And we were so in it that pretty much the whole time of Chavez, we always felt like all our stuff was super well thought out. And it didn't seem weird at all to to us. But every time we would play it to people, they would just be like, sort of puzzled not there was nothing shocking about it no one really ever hated us i think but no one paid any attention at all and we always felt like the stuff we were doing was really interesting and and ag- aggressive in its own way and yet it was weird it's, it really just from the inside out it was a it just seemed like nobody cared at all and um and we would go play on tour or go do something and really try and connect with people. And, and it just, it was a real slow burn. And I mean, this is big overview stuff, but like we literally at a certain point, we just felt like we weren't getting anywhere with anybody in the normal way of like touring, you mm-hmm. know, and then we became friends with like, you know, guided by voices and you can just see them like, you know, once they sort of, caught some air they just took off immediately and we're playing these big huge shows and we had some places like columbus was one of them i would say we did okay in like philadelphia new york seattle weirdly we did well san francisco we did well in la and chicago and that was it i mean nobody nobody gave a shit about us at all and it was a little weird because we'd all been in bands before and we felt like you know we thought what we were doing was really genius <laughs> and it, it sort of just, just felt like it never really took off. And so at a certain point we just said, fuck it, we're just going to do what we want to do. And that's it. We're artists. And we'll, if a show is an experience we want to have, we'll do it. If it's not, we won't. And it was weird. The less we played it seemed like the more <laughs> people seemed to, <laughs> to like us, which I don't know what that means, but um, but, but I will also say that like, that's just sort of the reception end of it. But from our, like, we, I really love both of those records and are so proud of both of them. And we were just, we approached them in kind of an interesting way. The first one I always felt like was just this manifesto of like what we were trying to do in we knew exactly we just wanted to throw down the terms exactly of what we were about and 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 i feel like it really does and we did something interesting too which is that first record we took the budget and we said rather than go with one producer and just you know set up do all the basic tracks do all that stuff what we do is we decided to do something interesting, which is rather than just get stuck with one producer and being like a guy, uh, you know, setting up the basic tracks and then doing it all in like five or six days and then doing moving on from there, and you kind of end up just getting a sound. We decided to get three different producers, and the, the theory was that we would do it like record an overdub and mix in like three or four days, like a long weekend. And if something came together quick 
and good, then we'd, do, we'd stick with it. And if it wasn't to our liking, then we'd just re-record it with another producer and see what they did. And it was great. It actually worked out really, really well. So we used Bob Weston and John and Yellow and um, Bryce Goggin. And, and it was exactly that. Like some stuff, just the performances just sounded better and, you know, one way. And then a couple of the songs we retried, tried again with, like with, like with, you know, and they've had completely diametrically opposed recording philosophies and it was great. And so that's how we ended up doing the first record. And I felt, I mean, we were so, it's so funny. We were so rigid about what would make the record and what wouldn't make it. And um, we were really like brutal quality control about everything. And which ended up sort of being a problem later because we, we just, it's so hard for us to get, we're just super, I wouldn't say perfectionist, but it has, it's like, you don't even need a full veto. You just need in this band, like sort of a slight, like wrinkle of the nose and once, and it'll throw a kibosh on some song (laughs) and no one will, it will get a stink on it that we'll never recover from. And so we were, there were songs that we never, put on the record that on the first one that were like totally good the song you faded we put on like the ep that we did and it was so should have been on the album and we were just really really brutal about it We had super high hopes. We thought it was like genius and it kind of did fine, but you know, no one seemed to care particularly. And then, uh, but it was, a. we went on tour. We went on tour with guided by voices in Europe. And then we did a full U S tour and also sort of a Northeast tour with guided by voices, I think. And, you know, we had a bunch of friends. We played, you know, here and there with different, you know, friends, bands. But uh, it was, you know, it it was just like, wow, okay, I guess we're starting over. And you, you know, it it was just unclear about where it was all going. And um, so anyway, we we that record, you know, Bob Weston had, you know, I'd known when he was the bass player in. Volcano Sons from Boston. Right. And he became sort of a protege of Albini in terms of recording. And so, and he's always been to this day, our favorite, one of our biggest fans and supporters and super sweet. He's super sweet to me. And, um, so we, uh, and, and I think, uh, one other thing that was kind of interesting about the Chavez stuff was one, we, we had like one of the best drummers in the world. And so we would literally try to, you know, try to focus parts and songs on him. And we had a song called, uh, peeled out too late. And we, <laughs> we used to call it featuring James Lowe. That's what we, <laughs> that was the name. And it was literally like we would try and do stuff that would be, you know, really show him and how he played. And we, we would, 
we would always, you know, we weren't so good at it, but try and really give as much space and air when he could really go off. When you have a really good drummer, there's just something visceral about it. Like when you're standing next to the drum kit and they're playing, it's just different than anything else. And he's just, he approaches it in a way that's totally unique and thoughtful and and musical. And then Matt and I were just, when I listen to the songs now, they're really, which I don't, but if I did, I think they would be <laughs> kind of, they were really you know, angular guitar parts and really, really harsh. And and one other thing that was really great was that our bass player, who we ended up settling on, was an old friend of Matt's, and he's awesome, named Scott Marshall. And he mm-hmm. was in L.A. a lot and traveling and gone a lot. And it was great because it really became the three of us. And then he would come in at the end, and we would always try to use that, that we'd basically create a song. And then we would do a lot of things of letting the bass part come in later and really letting that low end be this progressive surprise and this this thing. And so we were always withholding bass <laughs> and saving it till it would have the most impact. And... I don't, Matt makes fun of me for saying this, but I feel like that was sort of an innovation that we had. And like we would do, you know, parts, songs with like a verse and a chorus, and the bass wouldn't come in until halfway through the second right. verse, or something. And that I felt like was innovative, I have to say. Because it, it was, it really was. Nice low end. Yeah, I was going to mention that because you didn't hear that a lot in, I mean, production techniques as they evolved, the bass sort of became almost irrelevant to a lot of bands and a lot of genres of music. And when the bass comes in, uh, Break Up Your Band is a perfect example. When the bass comes in on that song, I mean, it is loud and it is distorted and it's in your face and it adds this real dramatic effect. Yes. It's like punctuating. It's putting the punctuation on the song when it comes in. Yeah. And, uh, As a and bass player we, myself, that was something that I was like, whoa, that sounds way cooler than the, you know, trebly bass I'm hearing on the majority of stuff on the radio. Yeah. 
and that song was sort of a good example of that, where it was like we came up with the because we, I think, I think yeah, on that on that song, I tuned down to a low A, as does Matt, and so essentially the bass is being played by the guitars. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? We have that within our range, and so the only way for the real bass to have any impact is to like come in with a proper you know entrance mm-hmm. <laughs> and so uh drama was always like a big i was a big fan of dramatic music and st- sturm and drang kind of you know let's make it as scary and and try and give people chills that was always the thing i really wanted to do and then we would kind of say, fuck it, let's write a funny pop song. And then we, not a pop song, but like some sort of rock song. <laughs> but then we would say, no, 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 let's go back to being dramatic. And then we would, and we, you know, we always wanted Chavez to be sort of mysterious and other and not, you know, the first single cover had a, an Asian guy on it. And we wanted it to be like, you know, this mystery of, what the band was in you know it's called Chavez but wait there's an Asian guy none of this makes sense and then so we would work really hard at that but then in the end we always really had fun and we're funny guys and I mean I'm a fucking comedy writer now and Matt is like you know brutally funny and then we would just sort of like ah fuck it let's do something goofy and funny and then we would go back to so it was always like back and forth but the the dramatic music you know is, is still probably my favorite stuff we ever did the ghost by the sea is you know i basically i didn't lift it but it was inspired by this piece this is gonna sound pretentious but this vapor the magic bullet and is that the name of it i don't know i i can't remember not the that's a magic flute it's the uh but it's uh we were really really into the dramatic you know, sort of scary moments. And sometimes I felt like, like Mouth Breather by uh, Jesus Lizard has that quality to it. Like really, you know, stuff that makes you want to break things. And Yeah, you're... like Shellac has that too. Yeah, yeah, and that that's obviously, you know, the uh, Shellac... But, you know, the, all that Chicago stuff, and this is really sort of where we, we came at it, which was, you know, Chicago stuff always had that, like, you know, tinny, like, screeching guitars, awesome drums, and the bass, you know, this driving bass part. Mm-hmm. And we really, A, wanted to write melodies and have singable songs and have those moments with them, too. And right. we just out of necessity ended up doing this thing where the guitar parts would be the things carrying it and we would sort of fake the bass and then the bass would come in sparingly and just you know sort of kick your ass by its entrance as I talked about and so it was a slightly different thing and when I listen to all that Chicago stuff I don't think we have we play with the same tricks but it no. but it, really, it really is this. it is a similar you know we wanted to make stuff that kicked your ass. I'm like, I think Albini really hated Bullet La Volta, but I don't think he ever gave a rat's ass about Chavez, whereas <laughs> and I think that's true of Todd Trainer. I mean, if I ran into him, he'd, I guess he'd recognize me, but like never gave a shit about the band, whereas Weston thought we were like Bob was like we were like his favorite band. <laughs> and so it was just it was always that way, you know. And, mm-hmm. and then in the end, the more we played together, the more um, it just became this sort of, we, I felt like we, that first record was really about us finding what it was we wanted to do and, and doing it and really fucking committing to it as hard as you can. And... I don't have a song list in front of me, but like, you know, Peeled Out Too Late is like an odd song structure. And yet 
we had played together enough to just know that that worked and um and again it was like you know doubling on guitar parts and then you know the bass doesn't come in until i think the chorus and or maybe i can't remember but it uh but that was like a really planned out you know we spent a lot of time constructing that and, and then once we did you know it, it's it's one of these weird things where it, it you know it doesn't really have a second verse and it's has a weird resolve and and um and yet it works and it that's always the best time when you get in any creative thing where you're like wow this is unusual but it seems to work no i know it works and we you know we thought it was this little you know dramatic huge peaks and huge valleys and huge dynamic shifts without being like a guy stomping on a distortion pedal you know and and i don't even know if anyone's ever talked about that so i've never read anyone talk about it, but that's like a really and ghost by the sea was the same thing it was like this real we wanted it to be almost like a to make it like an opera in three minutes or whatever to be as massive to almost be like a weird psalm at the beginning and then you know, just peek out as hard as you possibly can and then resolve in some emotional way. And um, I, th I stand by it. I mean, I think it's really, it builds up all this tension and then it has this really nice release to it and bombast and, and then it becomes musical at the end. And, you know, so this, the other guys in my band would be making fun of me for saying all these things, but I, they know exactly what the fuck I'm talking about. And then it was like, and then we also played on that first record with a lot of like really dissonant things like Relax Fit has one of my, you know, a few of my favorite moments ever. And it's so shrill and harsh. It's almost hard to listen to. That was written about our drummer's pants, which he preferred the Relax Fit. We kissed James Lowe's ass all the time and also made fun of him. But um, he was a little older than us, so we would always brutalize him which he seemed to like. We were real, you know, that record, we were just so, if anything didn't fit exactly the way it should be put together, like even good songs, we would just be like, no, it has. And we were always a big fan of like short records. And and so we did uh, like Van Halen records. We always loved because mm -hmm. they were nine songs. And um, so we just said, you know, let's keep it as tight and dramatic, not overstay our welcome. So that was the first record. The second record was really different. We really, um, we started to go with Bryce Goggin, who we just felt like was a bit of a pain in the ass in that he was sort of a little bit of a mad scientist and he'd get fully in it he would want to do what he would want to do and just get there. And by the time he kind of got there, you were a little bit burnt out so that your input was sort of coming later. 
than we felt like we wanted. But at the end of the day, it stuff sounded so good on the first record that we were like, you know what? Like, you should chase after what stuff sounds good. And then we record started to record the record with him, and it just nothing worked out. It was like he I don't know what it was. It just and we ended up having to ask for more money from Matador. And he was he was sort of blowing up as a producer and had all these other records to do. And so we ended up going back to Aniello, who really saved our ass. Um, and the second record was really different. I think we started to get, I was busy doing other work and, and we just, everything became a lot looser and less sort of rigid. And, and I actually think that was a good thing. And we went in with songs that like, I had to convince James and Matt to record this song flight 96. Cause they were just like, you know, James especially was just like, this is not ready. I mean, we're not, it's a half-assed thing. And I think sometimes you can record stuff that's half-assed and just somehow something happens. And we did. And I, I love that version of that song. You know, we were real close to not even trying. So it was felt really shaky like before we had known exactly what we were gonna do and we were super prepared. And this the second record was sort of we didn't quite there was just a lot of failure in the air because Bryce didn't really work out and stuff wasn't sounding good and stuff wasn't easy, but we just kept at it and and I think there's sort of a an ease with all of us that we did different kind of quieter stuff. And I also think in the, in the meantime, we'd become real tight with guided by voices. And so there was some, some sort of straighter song stuff that, that we liked and we just sort of allowed ourselves to do. (laughs) And now when I listen to it, it doesn't sound very straight at all, at all, but we, we really did, you know, sort of have a, it it just felt more loose and less sort of completely focused on, you know, there's a time, James said this, when you're trying to set the tone, which is what the first record was, you're really looking over your shoulder all the time, and you know, you're you're aware of what the impact is going to be. And the second record, we were just sort of really more into what we wanted to do and, just like fuck it and you know the stuff just ended up sounding there there was i think all of those half-assed qualities when i look back on them they're like that was exactly what we needed because we couldn't have had another record of just totally rigid you know exacting you know qualities we needed to have some looser stuff that didn't we didn't know what a solo was going to be until we went in, you know, we didn't quite mm-hmm. know what the melody was that, and and I think those things, those are good to do, and that was our time for that. And so, and I actually think I I sort of like I listened to that record more than the first one, but I think they're I don't listen to them that much, but when I get drunk and sad, sometimes I listen to them, and that that one I I tend to like. I tend to enjoy those songs recorded more than the first record, although they're both really good, I think. 
and I've never felt that way about anything. It's weird. Like I'm the worst self-hating douchebag when it comes to like my own material. And yet I really do like putting both of those records on. I believe in them. Do you think that that as time has passed, you've like, you obviously were real close to them at the time as time has gone on, you you're able to like listen to them more objectively and go, wow, what we did was really unique. And we, really did forge the path that not a lot of bands were attempting to go down and that's why you're able to you know yeah look no, at them I, and, think so. I think so i mean i think it, it's just weird it's like we like, i'm not being oh shucks and humble like nobody cared at all and we were all guys who had i mean matt and i james a little bit but definitely matt and i we had a lot at stake, you know, and mm-hmm. it was weird. It was weird to just be met with like a thundering silence. And yet we really liked what we did, but I mean, there was a real indifference to the whole thing and we couldn't figure it out. And it was like, does our breath stink? Are we just hacks? I don't understand. <laughs> and not that we wanted people to, we, we didn't need the seas to part, but it, there's a big difference when you're in a rock band between a pretend rock show and a real rock show. <laughs> Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? There's like, you hit a certain level when you play a show and the f- people are so dying to hear the music that they sort of initiate the energy. And then there's another one, the other way where it's like the audience is just sort of sitting there and it's up to the band to prove its point. You know, they're and almost like at- impress us. You have to impress yeah, us. Yeah. Yeah. And, And it's just like, it's the difference between, you know, hosting a shitty party where you're the host and everyone's talking or someone throwing you a surprise party, (laughs) you know? (laughs) And when you hit a certain level, like whether it's the blues explosion or GBV or someone where they show up and there's just an excitement where people are literally like, I'm here and I want you to give me this good stuff. Please start now because I'm dying for it. And that's just a totally different vibe than going up and having to prove your own existence is worthwhile. And it was odd, you know, it was odd. And so we always believed in it, but I remember we just felt like there was just not, we weren't touching anybody except for a few music nerds who were just sort of being polite. Like, (laughs) and... We were nice guys and fun to hang out with. And we felt like sort of the opening band to a lot of people, you know. And it was weird. And um, and if no one had ever said anything nice after it, I would have been like, well, I love that music. And I guess, you know, nobody got it or whatever. I would have felt the same way. But it's been like an out-of-body experience to have anyone pay attention to it, which I felt like. I did not anticipate at all. And um, and Matt, too, I think. There was a point at which he was in Zwan, and he said, dude. And I was like, what? And he's like, all these kids come up. To, I don't know what's the deal with, but the stench of our stinking corpse has people into it. I was like, what? And he was like, yeah, people are fucking into Shabbos. I was like, you're kidding me. What? He was like, no. All the kids, when I talk to them, they're all, I don't know what the deal is. And I remember that. I remember when it was a big deal that he was playing with Billy, and people were like, oh, I wonder what this is going to sound like. This is going to sound crazy. Yeah. And it just sounded well, like Smashing Pumpkins, <laughs> Yeah, honestly. Because well, yeah. you got Billy singing and playing most of the guitar stuff, and I think Jimmy Chamberlain was the drummer, right, in Swan? Yeah. So it sounded like Smashing Pumpkins, but with three guitar tracks instead of two. Matt and I were both friends with Billy way back when, and he was super into skunk, Billy was. Mm-hmm. And so when he, when it was time for him to do something post pumpkins, he came to Matt and said, you know, let's do something. And, and we had all sort of lost touch with him when he became a really big star. Matt, sort of asked me what I thought because we Chavez never broke up we never we always kept playing and we always kept writing stuff together in fact we have like a whole album's worth of material that I've been dying 
to do and keep trying and and we're still trying to schedule it and it's been really tough because Matt lives in New York but he does a lot of his work out here in LA. James is very cranky in general but very cranky about recording in LA and so we've been trying for the last year to we have 10 songs that are really really good that are literally peppered over the 10 15 years that we have just always written stuff like the last rehearsal we had we wrote I think the best song we've ever written and so well now you have to put it out with a lead in like that I mean you yeah, have to put that out I'm trying and it's just been it's it's really it's funny cuz I want to do it the most Matt probably the second most but he's so you know he's really busy and he's busy in this odd way like he gets a phone call and he'll be like come go on a tour with Cat Stevens or something and you know that's got to be a priority for him and and James is just very he's very reticent about being an old fogey trying to grab past glory but I don't care about that at all I'm like these songs are good I really would the last text I sent to Matt about it was if these songs don't come out before I die I will be really sad <laughs> and he was like me too but they're really good they're really good material so um, and Matt it seems like Matador, it seems like so. in the modern age that you guys I mean did you record all in a room when you were recording or did you do separate tracks for each no, we, we, would, we would all be in a room. So you wouldn't consider like having James, wherever he is, lay down the drum tracks no. and then... No. He's just, trying to work this out for you. I, I know. I'll give you his number. Okay. But he, uh, he's just very reticent about being lame, which is good, except that mm -hmm. Matt and I are pretty reticent too. And there's a point at which, you know, we really... It's like, I feel like we can do whatever we want. I don't care what anyone thinks. I just want to have these songs recorded, and they're really good, and and I really believe in the material. And so, and, and the other thing is, it's just hard, because they're both a little bit, and neither of them have kids, and they're both sort of artists, and just their their way of, their their criteria for how it works out is just a little different than mine, and I'm like, but I'm the I'm also super busy. I'm a writer and have kids, and it's very you know, it's, it's not easy for me. It's like really hard for me to say, oh, I, I can go to New York for two weeks, you know. So we're trying to work it out. But I feel like I feel like we will. I think we will. And uh, we we never broke up, and we never stopped doing stuff. You know, we've always, you know, there's some there's just there's nothing like it when the three of us get in a room and play stuff. We sort of move pretty quickly and the stuff is good. And so um, we're, uh, you know, I felt like that. And, you know, some of the, the stuff is really like as dramatic as I would want. And, you know, there's some punk rock element to it that was is new, but it's really good stuff. And, and I think, um, you know, we're, we're, sometimes I've learned the older I've gotten that like perfectionism is it is the enemy of good. You know, mm -hmm. you can be too perfectionist, and and our band was sort of a weird thing of like, like I say, I know this sounds it sounds really weird <laughs> weird to say it, but it's like we really believed in our stuff. It was like the best Chavez music I think you could, you know, make. And that's, I always was at peace with it because of that. I was like, this is what we were trying to do. We've done. And so if people like it, great. If they don't, well, it doesn't matter so much. It would be nicer if they liked it, but we did what we set out to do a hundred percent. And, but then you have that weird thing. It's like, well, you know, now what? And, we, it was really bizarre to have sort of a good seven or eight years sort of delayed re reaction and 
yet we kept playing and kept doing stuff. And I'm hoping, you know, we played a couple of ATPs. We played at uh, mm -hmm. Primavera. And those were all great shows. We had a blast. And we all get along. I mean, we all, they're still three of my best friends. And, and, and I think with good reason. Somebody, you know, the James is like, sort of has this old punk rock rule, like never go back to the thing because you can't. But I keep trying to tell them, like, nobody cares. Like, it's not, you got to just do what you do. And I, I really respect him for it. But, and Matt, Matt has gotten so busy that we used to, I mean, we used to live or die by every song we wrote and every choice we made. And, and I think those days are, are not, you know, we can't, we don't do that anymore. And I, I don't do that in my other creative life anymore. I used to be just so obsessed with, it has to be a hundred percent exactly right. And I think, um, I still think we could do a really, good record together that was like not trying to recapture <laughs> anything but just do the material that we've written and do it justice so so we'll see do you think that uh, writing has sort of loosened up your it has to be 100 percent right because i know you know if you're writing a screenplay if you're writing for a television show sometimes you have to deal with a deadline not necessarily and sometimes you have to deal with outside collaborators we're going to revise what you're doing and take it in different directions. Whereas you don't have that in a band, the band, basically you re work on a song, the song is done, you record it. And then there's the document and it's done. Whereas oh. if you're working on like a screenplay, the screenplay can go through iteration after iteration. And has that sort of changed your hundred percent, you know, has to be done this certain way philosophy. Uh, yes and no. I would say this, that this is a big topic for me. Um, I think the stuff, yeah, I mean, I think quality control and establishing a voice and working really hard um, at something and be unrelenting about being your own you know, most vicious editor is a good thing. But you also, like you said, have to get, you have to produce something, you have to get somewhere. Um, uh, there's something with, I've always been someone who needed to collaborate and I, I hate working by myself. And a lot of times as a writer, a screenwriter, I do that and I can't stand it. But lately I've been working on this TV show called Silicon Valley and I mm -hmm. work in, room of people and it's you know there's four of us now and and you see how excellent you know what makes it good is people who work really fucking hard and you know or is you know obsessed with getting it right in a good way and have sort of a tireless you know i worked with jj abrams for a long time he's like a sort of my mentor and he is always tinkering and working to make things better. And Mike Judge and Alec Berg, who I do the show with, there. But at the same time, there, it's just that thing where you have to find the balance between, you know, just, just you got to do it, and, you, you know, like writing the first season of a show, you're establishing everything, and so it feels like you're really working hard to. To set the tone, set the mood, set the scope, and everything, and that's that's like doing that first record. And then, you know, you also have to. Sometimes it's good to let the reins loose a little bit. I don't. It's funny because screenwriting for me has just become fun again once I've worked on the show. But I always say this about like screenwriting versus playing in a band that when you're when you're writing a script, it's just all the hard work and none of the fun. And so when you write a feature script, you work forever. It's, it's, you know, it's months. And when you finish your reward is that you get to stop. <laughs> <laughs> when you're in a band, you, when you write a song, you have to do all that. You have to write, you have to do the hard work of writing and making all the decisions and doing all this stuff. 
then once you have a song that you like, like A, you get to perform it in front of people, but you also get to perform it even rehearsing. You know, you spend three and a half, four minutes. You know, when I had a song I liked, I would make an excuse to, uh, let's run through it one more time. I just, I want to work on this thing. And it would just be to enjoy playing it, you know? Mm-hmm. And screenwriting, and now that I'm working on a show that we actually produce it, you know, it's a little bit better than just writing features, which, you know, it's so hard to get a movie made that I've worked on so many things that haven't ever reached an audience. And it's really, I mean, I'm grateful for the work and I like it, but it's also a weird feeling when you write these big stacks of paper that never get seen by anybody. Um, and yet you kind of, for me, I've just always put my nose to the grindstone and kept going, you know, not knowing how it was going to work out. And there's something great about music that, you know, when you, when you write something and you, you as a group, get it together enough to where you can play it out, it, you, you really, it's this amazing feeling when you play a new song and people respond positively or you can feel it in the room that people like it. <laughs> Movies and TV shows, it's such a longer process that, you don't, you know, there's nothing more visceral than being in a rock club and you play it in front of people and people's heads either nod or they don't nod, you know. And it's funny, it's the same, you you write a song and, you know, you're working on some part and it doesn't, you know, people's heads will nod when it's working, but then at the exact same time when it starts to fall apart, like you can just feel it <laughs> in the room right. and uh, people's heads stop nodding to it. And you're like, okay, something's wrong with this, but you, you know, you can just work on it, make it better. And, you know, but at least you're interacting with an audience. Whereas, you know, we don't on our show, we don't do anything until it airs. You know, you never have any idea of what people think. There's no testing or, you know, and it's just a really long process. So, but it's, 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 uh, I feel like Chavez was definitely moving back in the day more towards sort of a looser feel. And I feel like, have I, I feel like I've talked and I haven't let you ask any questions. No, that's fine. Um, I was going to ask where the creative writing was that something you studied at Harvard or was that something that you developed in New York as a, I don't know. I know you did the the Jimmy the cab driver spots with Donald, who had been the road manager Don, for for La Volta. Was, he was my roommate in college, and so okay. we were very close friends. And once he became an actor, then he, uh, me, and my friend Jesse Peretz, who was in the Lemonheads, and you know, at the radio station in college with us, mm-hmm. he was a video director, and I was working at MTV and. He had this, you know, very loose idea about a cab driver talking about videos, and maybe we could do one of those interstitial pieces that they. And because Donald is like one of the funniest motherfuckers ever, and Donald hadn't always used his humor to get, uh, to get parts in movies, but he'd never been allowed to do anything in anything yet, and so we built this beast that was like really perfect for his improv brain. And I enjoyed directing that those a lot. And but unlike Donald and Jesse, I had had very little experience with it. And they they both had sort of a body of work and when that hit they were just able to take advantage of it. But for me it was a little bit different. And so MTV was thinking about turning it into a movie. And from that I just said, well Eventually, I said, why don't I try to write it, you know, and I should learn how to write if I want to direct more stuff anyway. So so then um, Donald was in this horrible remake of Diabolique starring Sharon Stone. And the guy, he was like, dude, you should come out. You're writing the script. You should come out and meet this guy I'm in the movie with. He's this young wonder kid screenwriter. He's totally cool. And so, and he was like, he can help us write the script. And so I was like, okay. And that was J.J. Abrams. And so 
strangely I had never written a script before. And this, I guess he was in a lull, but he had always done super well as a screenwriter, but he wasn't famous like he is now. Mm -hmm. And basically, J.J. taught me how to write a script. And from that, from working with him, then I got a job. We wrote a movie together called Joyride. And right. then the same executive who worked on that did Office Space, and I met and I did a job with Mike Judge, and so we've been working together like 15 years, off and on, and um, and then we got to do this TV show Silicon Valley together, and so um, I had never, I was a guy who, when I graduated from college, I was like, fuck you, I'm never writing another paper again, and and somehow I became a screenwriter without ever intending to be one. <laughs> which is good and bad. I mean, I feel really <laughs> grateful and lucky. Most people who are screenwriters have, were dying to do it, which I still don't understand. And I just sort of backward ass came into it. And it was all like a good opportunity. And it was, you know, it's, it's creative and really interesting. But, you know, there's nothing like being in a band. And um, I felt like Chavez was was and probably will always be like my favorite art that I've done. It just felt like it was 100%. You know, I, I don't say that lightly when I say like I felt like we we knew what we wanted to do and then we did it. And that's such a rare thing in life to be able to say. And the fact that anyone's paying any attention to it today is just remarkable and I feel nothing but gratitude for that. I want to I want to backtrack for a sec. When you say that JJ taught you how to write a script, do you mean like he went like this is how you space the yeah, headers and these, or or did he go like this is a three act structure and this is how you this is where the beats that you hit and Both. was I literally didn't know where the margins were. Okay, and he was like, "Well, you should buy this thing called Final Draft," and I was like, "What? What is that? That's a hundred bucks. I can't afford that." And he was like. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and then I spent a year and a half working with him on stuff, and then another year after that working on stuff. And you know, he's a very generous, sweet guy, and super bright. And I think really took me under his wing in the best possible way. And he, you know, obviously he's a big, huge success now. I've heard that. I have heard yeah, that. He's involved in some sort of space movie yeah. right now. And yeah. none of it is surprising at all. Like, I mean, he's a super bright guy and just has his shit together on such a huge level. And what's always, you know, I think he, he like, always liked Chavez and was always really supportive of us, believe it or not. And uh, he... It's just, you know, I, I feel it's just one of those crazy things that I'm, I'm, I've always known what a badass he was and that he's famous now is really funny and, again, not surprising at all because he's he's really sharp dude. Have you pitched the idea of a, a new Star Wars cantina scene, but maybe the this, cantina band could be playing a Chavez song yes. like hidden hidden in there? I wish I got I got Chavez is on in the pilot of Silicon Valley. I know that. Uh, actually, Jay and I, my co-host, were watching the show. Uh, we both like the show a lot. And when I contacted you about doing the podcast, I had no idea that you had this other life that you were yep. a screenwriter and producer and written articles for the New York Times. I just thought you're the guy from the band. Then I I googled the name and I was like, holy crap! This guy's got a whole other. You know, like most people, they would do the band thing and they would be like, that's, I am now defined. I have been in a, a band on a major label or I guess I, Matador, I don't know if they're considered a major label, but one of the big indies, I guess you'd say. And then some people would be like, I'm a screenwriter or I'm, you know, have this other, but to do both in a single lifetime, it kind of reminded me of your story that you wrote about Jason Everman in right. the Times. We have almost like two distinct lifetimes within a single 
Like his timeline. is slightly more intense than mine. Yeah, yeah. he's his he's more intense, <laughs> definitely. But I was in reading that piece. Was there ever any thought of writing a script about Jason's life and sure. about what he's been through? Sure. I actually I got a bunch of book offers, <laughs> and he was out of the country doing something and with the Rangers. I don't know. He wouldn't tell me. And okay. I said, uh, I actually negotiated a fairly decent book deal. I was excited about and uh, not excited. I was, when it looked like it was going to happen, I was, from my end, I was like, wow, I would love to call myself an author. I would love to have written a book. But I'm not sure I would want to actually write a book. But it was so tantalizing. And then he came back into the country and was sort of like, yeah, if anyone's going to write a book about my life, it's going to be me, which is sort of the best reason to not. But he gave me the life rights for his movie, so I'm still sort of working on that. So, uh, But, yeah, it was a weird thing. And I felt, I've felt i always felt like that was – I was really excited not to inject myself into his life, uh, but to have written that story was, you know, really funny because, you know, I knew a lot of those characters. It was the same thing for me, like to call up guys I toured with, like Kim Thiel and, you know, Matt Cameron and talk to them about this time 20 years ago. And obviously they, their careers went one way and mine went another and, and Jason's went in a completely different one than either of us. So it was a real interesting, <laughs> you know, thing to revisit. And I think that's what the book would have been. But it was really, I was, I was, uh, those guys were really, you know, it's a, it's a funny thing. You never know how it's going to all unfold in your life. And there are no rules and you can kind of, do there's no career anymore you know people have like two or three different like ways of moving forward and figuring out you know my dad was a lawyer at the same firm for 50 years and i think he probably left you know more disgusted with them than ever and i just feel like we're all in this age where we have you know there weren't podcasts 10 years ago you know Mm -hmm. And you you never know what's what life's going to bring. And I think uh, I've felt very fucking fortunate to have something that I work on that's still intellectually interesting and and pushing me. But you know, being in a band makes you crazy because you're like it's the most immediate, fun, satisfying, viscerally rewarding thing to do. And So how do you step off of that, you know, but you have to a little bit. Matt always has a great quote, which is that you are in a band, you, you play music because you can get away with it. (laughs) (laughs) Just one of my favorite quotes, Uh, but it's true. You do it because you can get away with it, you know, and, uh, and I've always felt in my heart, like a rock dude in that way. Like I've always felt. I probably connected more with the actors than the other writers on our show. Uh, uh, Mike Judge is actually a musician, like a really sick stand-up bass player. And he was a professional for years before he ever, um, you know, did animation or anything. He played with like Doyle Bramhall and Anson Funderburg and sort of a Reverend Horton Heat type scene in Dallas and, but I mean, he's like a real musician, and I think we always connected on that because because it was, uh, you know, he neither of us sort of came from the typical Hollywood trajectory. I don't know what that is, but we always connected that we were over being musicians. So. Well, it seems like the from what I've read that there's like you go to USC and or or some or New York school and you get you. You go to a screenwriting class or what have you, and then you go into some sort of apprenticeship program and then 
become a you know assistant on a show or something like that or you know you work your way through these sort of uh traditional channels but it seems like nowadays with the growth of the internet like you could be a screenwriter like the guy who wrote the king's speech was like 70 years old living in london yeah. and got you know there's doesn't it doesn't seem to be as confined a road to that sort yeah. of a career anymore yeah but just I, I honestly believe if you do good stuff, it'll get out there. It will. I mean, it finds a way. People always talk about wanting to break into screenwriting, and I always feel like that's silly. It's like, it may be hard to break into the circuit of, you know, being a staff writer or something with a TV show. I can see how that would be a little weird, but if you have a good screenplay, people will end up seeing it, I think. I mean, but, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't think it's as hard uh, through the clutter. I mean, if, if you're good, that's what I love about music is that there's no barrier to entry. It's like if you want to be in a band so bad, you know, get instruments and guys, go play a show, and either people will like it or they won't, you know? And well, you're, it's really, and, it's volume. It's the sheer volume yeah. of number of bands, of num- amount of music that's put out each year or week or month that you have to, like, sift through i mean i remember working at a college radio station in the 90s we, you were at one in the 80s i believe in, yeah. in harvard i remember that there was a dramatic increase in the number of cds that we received from the distributors distributors and record labels it went from a box of 15 cds a week in like 1992 whereas in 1995 because all these bands had gotten scooped up by labels we were getting 200 cds a week and we we're like, how are we supposed to review all of this and figure out what ten tracks we're going to put into rotation? You know, it's like it's just you're just dealing with volume at that point. You're sort of like, right. it's all hit or miss. And I imagine screenwriting is the same way because now everybody has access to Final Cut and now every, or, or Final Draft, and there's all sorts of programs you can use to to write screenplays. So everybody who wants to write a screenplay, who has the an hour or two a night that they can sit at home after work and work on that screenplay. Now the people are probably getting inundated with, oh, here's yeah. my idea for the next, you know, Batman. I guess. I, guess. I, I can't tell. I mean, I think, I think, you know, people want to make fewer movies these days. But mm-hmm. in general, I think if you have a good idea, it kind of has a way of getting there. But, you know, if you look at the numbers, none of us should ever do anything. But you just have to trust and, like go for it and then if you know and then if you have something worthwhile people have a way of finding it i think you know just like guided by voices i mean it was that record that matt heard from his pot dealer that changed everything but they always did it for the right reasons and it was this amazing thing i have to put my kids to bed that's a great callback to the beginning of the episode so that's a perfect place to to wrap up right there if there's any other follow-ups of any type, feel free. I'm around, but I have to put my kids to bed. Totally understand. I really appreciate the time, and if I have sure. any other questions, I'll uh, I'll reach out. But all right, play. all right. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. Sorry to cut it short. <laughs> it's all right. I totally understand. <laughs> all right. Bye. Bye. Jay, that was the interview with Mr. Clay Tarver of Chavez. Any final thoughts before we put a bow on this episode? So did you get the feeling as you came out of that that the the, the new record is going to happen? I got the feeling that Clay wants it to happen, but there are forces conspiring to uh, possibly make that not happen, being the, the drummer. And the bass player, it sounded more like the drummer, but it sounds like, I mean, it sounds like there are songs, and I don't know if they just don't exist in any recorded form or if they're just demos, but there are definitely songs ready to go. And I don't know what their process is in terms of that, if they've if they've got stuff demoed and it's just not up to, you know, the recording standards that they want, but it sounds like, you know, they, they're planning reissues of all this stuff on vinyl next year. Mm. 
Uh, that that came out like just after we recorded. I saw a tweet from Matador that they were working on their presses for you know what was what was going to be pressed on vinyl for next year. Mm-hmm. So you know maybe there'd be an announcement. Maybe uh, there'll be some more reunion shows, and maybe there'll be a new album that'll come out next year. Um, announced when those vinyl records come out. That's just speculation, but that sort of timing seems to, would be perfect. So. So uh, Wikipedia says that guitarist Matt Sweeney has confirmed that the band is working on its first new recordings. So, and there's no, it's a citation needed, so I don't know where that came from, obviously. And it's Wikipedia, but, (laughs) you know, so there's always that. But I just found that interesting after hearing uh, Clay speak of it. It seemed to me a, a little bit more of a question mark. Yeah. So... I found that interesting. I know mm-hmm. I wouldn't mind if it happened. So. Right. <laughs> I mean, considering the material's done, it's just a matter of getting them together in a studio for, you know, I don't know how long it takes them to record, maybe a week or two weeks. Right. Then it seems like it should be doable. This isn't like getting Guns N' Roses back together, for God's sake. No, it's it seems like it'd be more <laughs> scheduling than anything. Yeah. Because as, as he mentioned, James doesn't, want to record out in LA and obviously sure. Clay is based in LA because of the TV show and his writing work. So that just seems like he would have to be on a break and maybe fly out to New York or, you know, Chicago or something like that to record. Um, if let me put, let me put this to you. If you could have them record with anyone, as far as like a producer, who would you like to have them work with? I don't even think it, does it matter with them? I don't even think a, a producer has any influence on that band whatsoever. <laughs> Do you? Well, I think, I mean, they mentioned, and, and I, I read this in an interview where they said that, uh, they, you know, Bob Weston was, you know, and he mentioned it, was a, was really a big part of the sound. And he worked with little to no compression, is what I read in an interview in Pitchfork. Uh, well, Whereas John Agnello yeah. worked with a lot of compression. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I would be interested I, to hear what they could do. You know, they, he mentioned that Steve Albini never mentioned anything about the band. I'd be curious to what they could do with Steve Albini, what kind of sound that would produce. Yeah. Well, I think it would be, my gut is telling me it would be similar to the Bob Weston approach. Like, it's more of an engineering take than a producer take. Yeah, mm-hmm. like, You know what I mean? Like, getting the sound of the band, not necessarily playing a role into developing the songs or anything like that. Um, you know, for them, I'm way, well, with any band, but really for them, I'm way more a fan of them going less compression, more of a room sound. Um, Cause I think that they pay so much attention to dynamics that you just, you really just want to capture that on tape. You don't want to force any of that with, you know, technology. You want them to, make that happen with their instruments in the, the room. So right. that'd be the approach of that I, I would prefer. That's probably what they've done on the other two records as well. So The only question I didn't get to ask him that I, I wanted to ask was, uh, who has better facial hair, uh, Matt Sweeney or TJ Miller on uh, Silicon Valley? <laughs> Which one's TJ Miller? TJ Miller is the guy who runs the house. He uh, created Aviato. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my god, that show is so funny! Yeah, I would, I would, you could have done a whole interview just on that show. With oh, them. absolutely! That show is that show is um, the last episode where they go to the uh, disrupt. Mm-hmm. Oh, that that is so funny! That there, I mean, there's just so much stuff going on. My and, favorite uh, scene was the um, the holographic comp- video conferencing system scenes. Oh yeah, I think it might be in the in the middle of the season. Mm-hmm. Oh my god! Because we use we use Skype so much. Well, we use it for the show, but also at work, we used it a lot for video conferencing. And just that whole like the guys that wrote that. I don't know if he had a hand in writing that scene, but the guys that wrote that have they just captured the ridiculousness of 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 working that way and communicating that way. It was brilliant. Yeah, maybe we'll have him on again. I've, there was a lot of questions I didn't uh, I didn't get quite to uh, ask, which is often the case when we do these interviews because they'd be four hours long and nobody wants to hear four hours. Sure. 
So uh, maybe we'll have them back. Uh, maybe we'll go back into the, to the Bullet Levolta catalog and, and review that. Mm. <laughs> maybe. Could, Who knows? Could do that. Want to remind everybody, if you like what you heard, please le- please consider leaving us some positive feedback at iTunes. And uh, requested reviews are closed for the 2014 season. We are, uh, we're all booked up. You snoozed and you lose. However, you can start picking your picks. Picking your picks. Uh, making your picks for uh, 2015, if you uh, so desire, by heading on over to digmeoutpodcast.com and hitting up our request a review page one th- once again thank clay for the generous amount of time he provided to us that's it i don't have a website to plug for him or anything like that just watch silicon valley when the second season starts i guess uh that's all i'd say so for jay i'm tim we're out and we'll be back next week with another episode of dig me out when we're the next clue, always find Join the conversation about this episode at digmeoutpodcast.com, where you can find links to our Facebook page and Twitter feed, as well as links to our request a review and merchandise pages. Yeah.